Orotata. Welcome into another episode of Playmakers, where every episode we will catch up with a personality of our rugby game, whether it be past, future or present. And this week we are very lucky to be joined by one of the best finishers in the game, former All Black Rico Gear, Riggs Kilda Mamoldi. How's it going, bruh? Kilda, yeah, no good, thank you, bro. Uh, not too bad. Always, uh, always good to see you, of course. Mate, you're looking slick, my mate. You just come back from the barber. He's looking very tan, very trimmed. Well, I had a bit of a clean up, you know, sort of, you know, it's all about uh, appearance and, um, you know, especially for you, you know, we don't get to catch up that often. So here we are. Now, um, bro, I mean, uh, a lot of people might or might not know, um, you grew up in uh, Gisborne. And uh, for you, bro, what was it like growing up in an in, in area such as X? I know it was a very sporting area, but what was it like for you growing up in, in Gizzy? Yeah, had a had a beautiful upbringing. Um, you know, grandparents who spent a lot of time on the you know on the farm, mm. um, you know, docking and, and being around sharing and all that sort of stuff on holidays. Um, you know, obviously the east coast was sort of obviously close to the beach, so did a lot of. Uh, I was actually a competitive swimmer, bro, growing up, Ooh. and um, and uh, I even jumped into uh, surf life saving, but. When I realised you had to wear those bungee snugglers, <laughs> I, I quickly pulled out of there. So uh, I didn't last too long, um, you know, in the surf life, uh, life saving scene. But again, you know, we sort of brought up playing rugby and rugby league uh, mm. on a Sunday. So, uh, yeah, so quite a lot of sports, which, you know, really grateful to have done. Yeah, I was going to say, I know you as a, as a junior were very, very good at rugby league. I mean, what was it that brought you to rugby? Yeah, so obviously, Tudongatani, so Gisborne Boys High. Um, mm. And at the time when I was at school, um, you know, coming through as a junior, um, Gisborne Boys High were extremely strong in their rugby union. You know, I think they were world champions. Uh, they'd won the top four. Um, they'd won the Condor Sevens. So, so I got to, I guess, um, be inspired by a, a very talented uh, group of, you know, rugby men. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, having a really good program, first 15, you know, as you know. Uh, so I just basically ended up going down that path. And, uh, and just stayed with rugby. So that's kind of how it all unfolded. One thing Gisborne didn't do that year was beat Te Te College, but that's for another that's for another <laughs> quarter. But hey, uh, like you said, um, going to Gisborne Boys High and, and having some supreme athletes go through that whole program along with yourself. When you first got there, who was the sort of guys that you looked up to in that first 15? Yeah, gee, there were a lot of good footballers. Mm. Um, I think one particular year they had six boys that made New Zealand secondary schools, you know, which is a phenomenal yeah. amount of players. Um you had guys like, oh, there was Jimmy Noble and Dan Godbold yep. and uh, Mutu Narimu was another one who, who, who does a bit of coaching at Hawke's Bay now. Yep. Uh, Mark Jefferson, who was a, a cricketer. So just a lot of really talented sports athletes. Um, and I think around that time, it was actually quite difficult, you know, being a, from a regional town for those sorts of boys to, mm. to, I guess, move on to, you know, first division sides. Uh, it was a bit more challenging back then. Yeah, the thing is, though, you sort of forget for such a, a small place, and a lot of times now we see a lot of players from such as Gizzy Boys going, going to other schools now, going to the so-called bigger schools and getting on TV and what have you. But I think back in those days when you were able to stay in your own area, every sort of um, first of thing, like Napier Boys, you go away to Napier Boys, I mean, Tote College, those sort of schools, and, and do those traditionals. or something unique about those times, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I guess that it was very tribal, and, yeah. you know, and to a certain extent it still is. Um, but again, you know, you, you spend, you know, whatever it is, five, six years, you know, representing that club, I guess you'd yeah. call it. And, um, you know, that, that's what the exciting part is. And, you know, we all played rugby when we were younger because you played with your mates. So, you know, you do that at school. And I think that's what makes it really, really special. Um, and, and it's pretty hard to, you know, as you know, we sort of, as we get older, we, we remember those times extremely well, and they're probably some of our, our favourite pastimes, you know, in rugby. Yeah, and uh, I want to take it on because you're only a young man when you made this team, and, and Amasio Valance was, oh, I think it was still at Sacred Heart at the time. Was the was the Com Games? Was it '98 Kuala Lumpur? And I know um, Marcio's story is like they they trained against the boys, and he carved up and ended up making a team for you. How did you actually make that squad? Wow, that's, that's, that's a really good question, bro, because um, I was playing for Poverty Bay at the National Sevens at the time. Yeah. Um, and then I think Titch might have picked a, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a 40-man training squad. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I went along to the training camp, and uh, out of 40 competitors there, you know, the first thing, of course, you know, what we did back then was we do the, the bloody beat the test. The beat test. Um, 
And, uh, <clears throat> you know, being uh, a little bit naive, um, I, I sort of rocked up and I came dead last in the, in the big test. Um, so I thought to myself, I'm never going to make that side. But uh, luckily for me, it just didn't come down to the testing. I was able to sort of play my way into into the squad eventually. Um, but I, I guess just, uh, that's how it started, bro, just, just going along to the national, you know, the national sevens yeah. where all the unions were involved. Which um, I, I guess you know, sort of, sort of missed that a little bit. You know, seeing that, um, you know, the, the the smaller unions taking on the bigger sides. Titch always loved picking a bolter, and you're definitely one of them, along with Amasio, uh in that in that in that team. But what was it like? We talk about. Well, I mean, it's hard for people to sort of understand how hard Titch's trainings are. And as a young man, I mean, I, I know how tough it was for me. But how how did you find that those first couple of camps, and especially being at Com Games, where it was it was massive. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a real shock. Um, you know, you had to. I think pretty quickly you realised the you know what it was going to take uh, purely from a fitness point of view. And you know, like all good Maori boys, we we rely on uh, our talent. Um, you know, most of all, um, <laughs> and, and and fitness and and all that sort of stuff wasn't necessarily at the you know the front of the mind. But you quickly had to sort of uh, adapt to that. And you know, with guys like. You know, Eric Rush and, and Dallas Seymour um, that were in the squad at the time, I think they were the older guys at the time. And, man, they were the fittest dudes. But, you know, and, and again, that was sort of inspirational. And I think, you know, when you're around that sort of thing, um, you know, you, it, it rubs off on you. So you just have got to make a decision and make a choice. And, um, yeah, sort of had to come up to speed pretty quickly or you, or you weren't going to make the side. So a young kid from Gizzy playing for Poverty Bay at the Nationals goes in, gets picked for a Commonwealth Games, gets picked with, like you say, Eric Rush, All Black, Dallas Seymour, All Black, Jonah, All Black, Christian Cullen, All Black, Bruce Rahan, uh, Roger Randall. I mean, and then there's you and Moji. How was that like, not only being part of that team, but going as a New Zealand squad, you know, a whole New Zealand team, New Zealand, to, to a Commonwealth Games in Kuala Lumpur? Yeah, man, I, I was just um, I was just happy I got to play next to Jonah. That, yeah, that, that's hard. all I was worried about. <laughs> I'm not worried about, but excited about. Um, you know, just training uh, you know, next to the big fella. And, uh, you know, because that was 98, so, you know, mm. a couple of years after that 95 World Cup where he became a superstar. Oh, yeah. um, and then in the Com Games Village, um, man, it, you know, people would stop him wherever he went, uh, which was pretty special. But, yeah, being, being a couple of the younger guys... Uh, it was a it was quite a tough build up to that to the games and you know we I think we had a squad of might have been sixteen or seventeen guys and you know guys that that are your best mates you know were missing out on the team yeah um, you didn't know if you were going to make it especially I think you know us being younger guys we thought oh you know we don't really have the experience so we might miss out so you play a lot of mind games with yourself but um, you know Titch called us into the headmaster's office and uh, <laughs> had the conversation and. Geez, I've never been so nervous, but, uh, you know, really grateful to uh, have had that opportunity. I'll move on because I got injured, so I didn't really care about Kuala Lumpur. And I, I, I cried when you guys won the, the, the gold medal, my mate, but congratulations. Hey, um, <laughs> but uh, also, you went on to, uh, once, you, once you did your seventh thing and you did that for a while, and were outstanding, and went on to the, the 15th career, had a massive career there. Uh, I mean, playing for the Blues and the Highlanders, and then you went to the Crusaders, the end of, I think it was 04. And then 05, you had a massive season. So I just want to ask you, like, we were in the Highlanders together, and that's a really cool environment, but what was it about this Crusaders environment do you think that allowed you to thrive in 05? Yeah, it's, you know, you always hear about what's the secret to mm. uh, the Crusaders' success, um, and it, it obviously hasn't changed. It's, it just keeps evolving, and I think that was the thing they... Always um, looking at ways to do things, you know, better. And you talk about the one percenters, and mm. it just comes down to a lot of it falls back uh, on the individual in terms of accountability. Yeah. Um, you know ha how you how you want to be seen. You know, representing the jersey a little bit. You know, a lot of the All Black um, standards uh, uh, are certainly there. Um, but I think what I found uh, down at the Crusaders was there was actually no pressure. So. I guess when you're in a, an environment where you're happy, you're comfortable, uh, there's no pressure, you can really get the best out of yourself. Because um, as we know, when you're enjoying, uh, you can see when players are happy, they're, they're, they're playing their best rugby, they're smiling, um, you know, they're not, they're not feeling restricted. Uh, so, you know, it's not just one thing, there's, there's a number of things there. And obviously the coaching, I think the coaching was really important. Um, at the time, obviously we had Robbie Deans. Yeah. He was probably the best coach um, at the time for 
uh, really having that player um, to coach relationship. Uh, he was extremely good at, at being on your level, so you never had that. Um, you know, I guess when I first sort of played Super Rugby, it was very separate. You, know, you got yeah. the coaches and you got the players. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, and you can see that with uh, you know Scott Robinson, you can see he's he's still a player, but he's their coach. So I think that balance. Uh, has been really important, and, and I think it's been a part of the success of the Crusaders. Yeah, do you think when you say, like, no pressure, is it, is it more the, the pressure comes from within the group, rather than peer pressure, like, say, to turn up on time rather than the coach, like you say, putting his, putting his fist down? Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. Um, you know, you feel it from within, so it's not it's, def- it's not external pressure. There, there is obviously internal pressure, but it's... Um, it's collective, and, and it's from your mates. So obviously their bonding is really important. And I just found that Christchurch, uh, you know, very sporty city, um, I think it really allows for teams to come together. Um, you know, like, I just find that it's, it's, for me, I found it was a bigger version of Gisborne. We're very, very sporty, very, very intimate uh, as a city. So therefore, we got to spend a lot of um, times, you know, with other family members and their families. You got to know the names yeah. of, you know, all the kids. So just things like that sort of made, um, you know, made it all come together. Obviously, they made you um, read a, uh, a, a dictionary down here. Your vocab's outstanding, my mate. But um, <laughs> uh, t- yeah, that was I did that in, in the outside of training. <laughs> Because all I did at school was play rugby, so I needed a few minutes. <laughs> nah, it's awesome. It's awesome, bro. But I just want to go back to this 05 season. I mean, it was huge for you. I mean, 15 tries in, in Super. I mean, you're Super Rugby Player of the Year. You're Māori Player of the Year. I mean, obviously, was there anything you changed physically leading to that, that build-up or that year? Yeah, I think it was just, um, I think maturity comes into it. I mm. think I was about 27 at the time, so I wasn't, you know, a, a spring chicken. Yeah. But, um, and I think earlier in my career, sort of through my early 20s, over the period of about three years, I had a lot of hamstring um, issues. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably thanks to Titch, but, you know, managed <laughs> to sort of get, get, get past that and then uh, had a bit of time in the saddle with the Blues. Yeah. You know, 2003, won the Super Rugby um, that year. Played a lot of rugby in 04 with the Blues, so uh, you know just got got a bit more experience. Yeah, um, and then had an extremely uh, tough off season um, at the end of 04 on the back of an All Black tour, and then yeah. was was pretty much set up for you know a good 05 season. I was going to say that 05 and the All Blacks you took off. I reckon you really felt comfortable and massive. Um, and, and I was you spoke about the age the where you come to sort of mature. There's a lot of young guys making the All Blacks. Now, what's your thoughts on that? Because I've been thrusted straight in there, you know, and they still, I don't think, totally learnt their trade where you you had had and, and, and blew up. But what's your thoughts around there, man? Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I think if you look at it, the, the younger boys are probably different athletes, mm. you know, today. They're, yeah. they're, they're as physical, you know, as as an experienced winger is. They're, they're big and they're strong and they're fast. Um and I think, you know, you can see the talent that they've got and, and it's super exciting and, and you can see that, uh, you know, the All Black selectors, you know, have been looking for that blend of really experienced guys but also uh, a couple of younger guys that can really light it up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that's really important. I, there's certainly a place for those younger guys. Um, I think, you know, when you look at the outside backs, particularly on the wing, um, you know, only a couple of years ago, Rico Ioane was was a superstar yeah. on the wing. It was like, oh, he's going to have 10 years on the wing. And then all of a sudden he wasn't even getting a run two years later at the World Cup. Mm. So from, a, I think that would be the toughest thing for those young boys is just understanding that um, there's a lot of competition on the wings and there's a lot more movement, mm. uh, you know, with the outside backs. Um, so I think that's really going to be the challenge moving forward. Hey, who was your Ruby with the All Blacks? Did you, did you have to switch around or did you, were you able to go with the same bloke or what was the story there? No, you actually got to change around a little bit. Um, I think if you were uh, close to Test match time, you'd, you'd, you'd probably you'd be in your you know your positions, your back three, your centres, and you know you'd, you'd room with those sorts of guys. Yeah. Um, if you if you're in camp a bit earlier, then you tend to get uh, you tend to mix up, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there's there was a good good mixture there. Probably one of the the worst roommates I had was a guy called Chris Jack, the big lock. Big the big bugger. Yeah, quite a selfish guy, you know. He, um, <laughs> he, uh, 
you know, you'd come in after dinner, uh, you know, eight o'clock, ready to watch a bit of TV. You know, you get all comfortable on the bed, and then our mate turns the TV off and goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I actually want to watch some TV here, Jacko. Uh, I'm not sure what you're up to, but uh, no, he's a good man, Chris. Um, you know, you get to you get to meet a lot of different characters. And, yeah. Um, you have some good times with those guys. You spoke about the coaching group with the Crusaders. How was the coaching group with the All Blacks? Yeah, um, when I made the ABs in 2004, um, obviously on the back of 2003, it was a new coaching setup yep. after John yep. Mitchell. Yep. So obviously Graham Henry uh, was was new and and, and um, Steve Hansen was there. I think that might have been his first year. Um, and Wayne Smith had obviously come back in. Yep. So... I was lucky enough, I, I did have a bit of a relationship with Graham Henry. He actually got me out of Poverty Bay to play rugby in Auckland. Uh, so I can sort of thank Ted for that. Mm. But I uh, I played a season for Poverty Bay and went to the Stein Lager Rugby Awards. And, you know, back then it was three divisions. So I was playing in the third division for Poverty Bay. And, you know, he got nominated as a, a player of the year for each division. So I made the final three for that. I didn't win the... Uh, um, you know, the player of the year, but I was sitting at the same table um, as Graham Henry and after the event, he just walked up to me and said, you want to come play, you know, rugby in Auckland, sent me a contract and where we went. So it was probably right place, right time as well, um, you know, with that. And that's how it kind of got started too. How was that move though? Going from Gizzy to Auckland's a pretty massive move. Yeah, it was real <laughs> massive. Uh, Petrol prices are a bit higher. <laughs> Well, I couldn't take my bike up to Auckland, bro. That's for sure. Um, I, I was lucky enough, you know, to uh, no, I got given a car, and, and yeah. that was great. But yeah, the transition was a bit of a wake-up call for me. Um, I got invited to a blues training, mm. um, and uh, I think Graham was the he was the coach. I, I can't remember what year. Might have been '98 or something, or '90s, yeah, '98. And uh, I went to training, and uh, you know, training was ten o'clock. Yeah. So, like a good coasty boy, I show up at five past ten, <laughs> and um, the boys had already started doing the three k, and I'm standing there. No one knows who I am, and they're like, "Who's this random guy?" And I just kind of floated around, walking <laughs> around in circles, and then I left about half an hour later. Um, it was just, yeah, it was just really weird. Um, I felt like an outsider, which you know I was, yeah. and uh, but again, you know, I wasn't there on time, and um, just just little things like. That it sort of you learn pretty quickly to uh, you got to get right. But then you actually saw the the light and come over to the right side of the bridge and played at North Harbour, my mate. So um, we, had, we 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 had a bit of a tribe there, didn't we? But how, how did you find being over there? It'd be a totally different feel to Auckland, wouldn't it? Yeah, and that was it. I, I guess the reason I went to Harbour was it, it probably I had a lot of a lot of mates there. Mm. You know, the guys like yourself, which I looked up to as a schoolboy, and you know, Rua Tipuki and Eric Rush and Frano Bodica. Yeah. You know, Buck Shelford was the coach. You know, there lots of inspirational characters there. So for me, 100%, it felt like home, um, you know, going there. And, and um, the four years I had there were certainly, you know, some of the best years that um, that I, I played a, a lot of good rugby, you mm-hmm. know, with North Harbour. And I think the environment allowed for that. And, and the way we played rugby, yeah. um, you know, was, was exciting. And, and we tipped over some really – we tipped over a lot of the top sides, you know, over those years. So – no, really good memories. Oh yeah, she's especially down Rotodos, but we won't go there. I mean, um, I want to go to the uh, I want to go to the when you played the British and Irish Lions. I mean, when you get that opportunity, because it doesn't come round for a lot of people, and some people don't get to do it throughout your career. You got the opportunity uh, to play against the British and Irish Lions. I mean, how massive was that for you? Yeah, it was. Um, you don't. I guess you don't really understand the the meaning of it until you're in it. Mm. Um, and fortunately, before the the three tests, we got to play um, play with the Maori side first. Yeah. So um, that was um, my intro to the Lions series. Um, you know, with Matt Tapo, um, we we played a preseason game in Fiji. So we we went over to Fiji um, to play them the week before, um, just to get a bit of rugby in and combinations going. And then prior to the the Maori game against the British Lions, we had Aaron Penny. Um, who was the, the the big number eight that was an All Black, mm. and he spoke about the opportunity that he got as a Māori All Black 12 years earlier, um, and he talked about that particular game and the Māoris were somewhat dominating, you know, the British Lions, yeah. and they, they kind of had the game in the bag, and then I think towards that, that, that back end of the half, they, they sort of let the game get away and they lost that game. So uh, listening to his speech um, was 
was really sort of had at home the importance of, you know, the opportunities don't come around um, like you were saying, and that was certainly a one-off. And um, you know, it set us up for that for that Maldi game beating the British Lions, and then of course we were set up for um, you know for the Test matches. Did you get yourself on a, a jersey, a British and Irish Lions jersey? Yeah, I did actually. Um, I managed to get Shane Williams uh, jersey, nice. the winger. So yeah, I've got it got it uh, stashed away there. You moved on to Contessi, went to Japan, but I want to talk about now what you're up to. A lot of um, players from our, or my era and, and leading into yours, really struggled with their transition over from their playing career into into the into the work environment, I suppose. And, and you've you've actually done really really well. So you've got a your Gear Rugby Academy started up. Just just talk us through that, how that all sort of eventuated. Yeah, so we've got a Gear Rugby Academy. My brother Jose, he lives up. Um, so we're obviously in Australia. He lives up yep. the sunny coast. So. Uh, it was just, and we've been a part of the um, the IRANS program, but the Australian version. So we've done a bit of coaching there. Um, so there's just an opportunity to come together and, and create that brand. So Gear Rugby Academy. So we're running um, obviously school holiday camps. So that's that's you know just a little something that we're that we're sort of doing in the next couple of weeks, which was awesome. Um, and then you know sort of got RicoGearRugby.com, which is this brand here. Yeah. So we're releasing a rugby skills app built in with, uh, it's got AI built into it, so that'll be probably rela- released later in the year. Got an online shop connected with that. It's funny, bro, I, ha- I actually had to write down a list of the things that I'm doing because <laughs> um, I, I was bound to forget something. Yeah. Um, we've just created a, a rugby beach brand, so there's going to be a rugby tournament later in the year. It's going to be a big event here on the Gold Coast, so you know, it takes a lot of months to develop that. Um, we've got a podcast called The Ruck, so obviously we had you on as yep. one of our first uh, <laughs> our first superheroes, um, and we've had you know we've had Aaron Smith and Kevin the Alarm, yep. so that's on uh, Spotify, so that's called The Ruck, uh, catching up with boys. So we'll kick that off again probably um, in the next sort of couple of weeks. Yeah, um, we've done a pilot for a sport that's uh, called the Sports Bar, you know, a bit like Sports Cafe back in the day. Yes, um, again more sports, so there's a bit of that. And then I've got an online um, sort of supplement brand, um, which is protein and energy and, you know, performance products. Newcastle Knights are using the products yes. at the moment. Uh, Isogenics is branded across the back, so been involved with that. And on top of that, bro, I'm, I'm still involved with rugby, so I'm coaching at Bond University. Oh, so man, that's uh, massive. That's awesome. There's plenty. But, you know, I, I guess you talk about the transition and um, – when I finished playing in Japan, I, I, I went back to Gisborne for a couple of years and I worked with the rugby union there, so yeah. under the New Zealand Rugby Union umbrella, so, you know, fortunate to sort of spend a bit of time, uh, you know, in that role. And it, it does, it takes it takes time to, to find where you fit, mm. where you fit in. Um, certainly challenging, but also the beauty about being a professional rugby player is you, you get to, you know, you get to choose. Um, you can choose what you want to do and, and sometimes, um, you know, that does take take time. Some guys uh, know what they're going to do when they finish and, yep. and other guys don't. And, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, and it's taken a few years to figure that out. But um, you've got to surround yourself with good people and, you know, you're the sum of the five people you hang around. So yep. probably fortunate for me, I'm not hanging around some of my old mates because they really <laughs> used to leave me astray. But, um, you leave t and yeah, Matua <laughs> Parkers than alone, my mate. They're doing good guys. Not naming names. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but you know, so so you know, and that's where we are at the moment. So I think it's um, you know, you just got to sink your teeth into something and and enjoy what you do. And so, if the, if the boys want to get some protein or people want to get some protein, they just go to your website, do they, and then hook those up? Yeah, yeah. So gearupwithrico.com. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's plenty of information there. You go to the website and you'll see, um, you know, a lot of detail around, uh, I guess, why we need certain things to help us with training and recovery. Um, a lot of professional athletes are already using the product, so it's just that you know that one or two percent that um, you know we're always looking for, especially uh, you know as athletes and, and sports people. Well, I need more than one and two percent. I probably need twenty percent, my mate. So I can't wait for the care package. Hey, you know what? It's always a pleasure catching up with you, my man. Sounds like you're doing awesome. You're thriving. We all hope it go well, brother. No pleasure. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having us, KT, and um, you know always. Uh, you know, you know, great to catch up and, uh, you know, really loving watching, uh, you know, New Zealand rugby and, and what's happening with uh, Aotearoa, you know, Super Rugby. Um, it's, it's really exciting. Awesome. Kia ora Māori. There, it is, there he is, Rico Gear, absolute weapon. Awesome to see him thriving. Once again, Playmakers is where it's going to be at. Make sure you catch us soon.